Today, it's a pleasure for me to present uh, Marco Fenucci from the University of Belgrade. Uh, he got uh, his PhD just a couple of months ago, in April, if you remember well. Mm, yeah. Mathematics in Pisa. <laughs> That's why I know him quite well. And today he will uh, speak about uh, numerical methods for the computation of symmetric periodic orbits of the embodied problem. When you want, Mark, you can. Okay, okay. Thank you, Giulio, for the introduction. So, as the title says in this uh, seminar, I want to focus on numerical methods uh, for the computation of these symmetric periodic orbits. So, we will start with some uh, introduction just to see the motivation and why we want to compute these orbits. Then, I will explain the numerical methods that we're going to use to compute these orbits and then we will see some application first to the embody problem and later to another problem which is the Coulomb one, uh, one plus embody problem. So the motivation uh, start from uh, a particular topic of research started in the last 20 years uh, because uh, in the last 20 years, um, uh, some many authors proved the existence of many periodic orbits uh, of the embody problem. Uh, and all these um, orbits has, uh, have, a, have some common points. Uh, for example, one common point is that they have all equal masses. Uh, and in particular, some of these orbits are called choreographies and has this particular uh, property that uh, all the masses follow the same uh, path, the same trajectory with the same time law, but with a constant time shift. And maybe the most famous orbit of this kind is the figure eight solution of the three body problem that you can see here on the left. And actually, this uh, orbit was found first with numerical methods, and then later uh, the existence have been proved by uh, Chancine and Montgomery in the year 2000. Uh, so, from the existing point of view, these orbits uh, have another common point. Indeed, the technique to uh, prove the existence of the orb of these orbits is more or less always the same uh, in the sense that uh, they use the uh, variational formulation of the classical mechanics uh, so the embody problem is described by a Lagrangian which is simply uh, kinetic energy plus the gravitational interaction between the particles and then through uh, the variation on principle of classical mechanics, we know that periodic orbits with a fixed period are stationary points of the Lagrangian action, which is simply the uh, integral of the uh, Lagrangian. Uh, so to prove the existence of periodic orbits, uh, we simply use the direct method of calculus of variations, and we search for minimizers of this uh, Lagrangian action. So this is the uh, variational point of view, and then we will skip, now we'll skip to numerical methods that are uh, useful to find this, uh, these orbits. So since we want to search for minimizers, the most simple uh, method to search for a minimizer is the gradient method. Uh, so in the gradient method, we in general have a, a function and we start from a first guess and then we start to follow the maximum descent direction, which is uh, minus the gradient, for example. This is minus the gradient. Uh, but here we said that we are dealing with a functional, which is not a function, so we have to uh, discretize it somehow. And to this end, uh, since we are searching for periodic orbits, is 
natural to take into account to truncate the Fourier series. So we fix some maximal order Fm and we consider truncated Fourier series. Then we compose this Fourier series with the action and we obtain uh, a function from a certain Rn to uh, R. Uh, and then we can apply the gradient descent to this uh, function and we simply have to compute the derivatives of this composition. Uh, these derivatives are uh, computed very simply because uh, the kinetic term can be actually integrated. Uh, it corresponds to this first term. And then we simply have to compute an integral of the derivative of the Lagrangian uh, times a cosinus or a sinus function depending on the coefficient that we are taking into account. So in these derivatives, however, we note that there's a term which is k squared, uh, which may grow up at high frequencies, especially if we uh, set a high truncation order for the Fourier series. And this may cause an instability of this gradient descent. And to deal with this, we can simply modify the step uh, by uh, multiplying the gradient by a term which is proportional to k square and this remove this instability. So from the coding point of view and for um, the efficiency, uh, this method is very easy to code because we simply have to compute an integral. And it also has uh, other pros in the sense that we can start from some rough approximation of the solution and it anyways converges to, to something. And we can also check if the action is decreasing since we are uh, searching for minimizers. And we can also uh, check if the relative acceleration, I mean, if the acceleration of our uh, truncated Fourier series and the forts along this, this uh, loop, uh, they are going to match in the sense that they are uh, going to be uh, close to a solution actually. So however, it has also some uh, cons in the sense that it is a bit slow in the convergence especially if in particular in the embody problem is there are uh, some close approaches between the particles because we uh, we need uh, a high truncation uh, uh, degree and also we don't obtain a uh, very good precision when there are close approaches and it doesn't even uh, provide information about the stability of these objects. So another method useful to compute uh, periodic orbits is the shooting method. And the, um, the goal of this method is to solve this boundary value problem where we have a dynamics, which is the, uh, the dynamics given by the Lagrangian and we have uh, a periodic boundary condition. So here I wrote this condition in this way because uh, we can also take into account symmetries in this way, but if you take m equal to one and s equal to the identity, you simply have the periodic boundary condition. So the shooting method is defined in this way. So we fix some um, points in the time, and we define this function g. Uh, what does uh, function means? It means that we take uh, a point in the space, which is x uh, i minus one, and we start following uh, the flow of the differential equation uh, for a time uh, tau y minus tau uh, y minus one, and we subtract the following point. Uh, so if we have at a zero, it means that 
following the gradient from the point x i minus one, we arrived to uh, the point x i. Uh, so this means that uh, zeros of the function g corresponds to uh, periodic orbits. And the aim of the method is to find zeros of this function and to solve this uh, nonlinear equation, we apply the Newton method. So in general, the Newton method, uh, this, the general step of the Newton method is defined by uh, a linear system whose matrix uh, corresponds to the Jacobian matrix of the function G. And the Jacobian matrix involves uh, the derivative of, of, of the flows. Uh, however, uh, this Jacobian matrix will be singular at, at zero because uh, if we are searching for periodic orbits, uh, there's a, a degeneration in the sense that there are infinitely many initial conditions that we can take along the orbit. So we have to uh, isolate an initial condition somehow. And this can be simply done uh, by requiring that the displacement of the first of the first shooting point is um, transversal to the uh, to the vector field, and this is very easy to to code because usually to isolate an initial point, the usual technique is to fix. Uh, a transversal section and compute the Poincaré map, but in this way, we don't have to compute any uh, Poincaré map. And as a remark, uh, we said that we need the Jacobian matrix of this function G, and uh, we need also the derivatives of the flow with respect to the initial condition. So we have to uh, solve simultaneously the equation of motion and the variation equation. So the shooting method uh, has, again, some pros in the sense that it is very accurate in computing these uh, periodic solutions. And it also provides uh, info on the stability of the orbits since we have to compute the derivatives of the flow and the stability uh, is determined by the spectral properties of the derivatives at the, uh, at the ending point in time. Uh, on the other hand, we need a very good first guess to obtain the convergence of the shooting method since it is anyway a Newton method and we have no info on the minimality of what we are computing in the sense that we can end up in something which is not a minimum, but we will see in a minute how to deal with this. Uh, another, another method which is useful is the continuation method. Uh, and we will see later how to apply this. So now we suppose that our vector field uh, depends on a parameter, which is this lambda. And suppose that we have a solution of, of course, now if the, uh, if the vector field depends on a parameter, also the function G depends on a parameter, on the same parameter. So suppose that we have uh, a zero of the function G for a certain value of this parameter, and we want to displace the couple uh, to another zero of the function, for another value of the parameter. So the continuation method is defined by this uh, nonlinear uh, system. So we're searching for the zero of G, and at the same time, we want to try to displace the entire couple by quantity delta, and still this uh, nonlinear system is again solved with the Newton method and actually when we know how to code the shooting method, coding this continuation method is actually uh, really simple. 
So now I would like to say some words about the minimality and see how to deal with this with numerical methods. So at first glance, one could argue, could say, well, okay, you have discretized the action, uh, so you have a function and you can compute the, uh, the action of this function and see the spectral properties. But we can do something uh, which is kind of better in the sense that we can use the theory of local minimizers. And uh, we know that if we have a solution, uh, the minimality, the local minimality properties are expressed by the second variation, uh, which is a quadratic functional, which involves the second derivatives of the Lagrange. And we know that if the second variation is positive definite, then our periodic solution is a minimizer, at least a local minimizer. Uh, so we have to search for some conditions to verify that the second variation is positive. Uh, so to the second variation, we can associate its Euler Lagrange equation, which in this context is called Jacobi differential equation. And we fix some notation and we call with Y0Z0 and YTZT the solution. So the Jacobi differential equation with this particular initial conditions. So we take zero for the special component and the identity for the velocity. And on the other hand, we take uh, zero and minus the identity for the other solution. And then we also define this uh, W, which is simply Z times the inverse of Y. Uh, so we can prove actually that the second variation is positive for every um, periodic variation, if and only if the determinant of the solution Y0 that we saw before is uh, different from zero in the whole interval. And this matrix, which is uh, constructed with these two solutions of the Jacobi differential equation, is positive definite. And actually, we can uh, check these two conditions with numerical computations because we can simply compute two solutions of the Jacobi differential equation see if the determinant is always different from zero and then uh, construct this matrix and compute the eigenvalues. And it should be noted also that if we write uh, the variational equation and beside we write the Jacobi differential equation, we see that they're basically the same differential equation. So we don't have to code anything new. We simply have uh, everything to construct this, uh, this algorithm to check these conditions. Uh, so now I'd like to see, to uh, apply all these methods to some concrete problem. So the first one is the embody problem. And we're gonna see how to compute this uh, periodic orbits with the symmetry of platonic polyhedra, whose existence has been proved in this paper by Fusco Gronchi Negrini in 2011. So the setting is this one. So we take a uh, platonic polyhedra, we take its rotation group R, and then we consider n masses, where n is the number of rotations in the group, and we take also unitary masses. And we take, of course, the embodied problem. Then we're, gone, we're going to impose some constraints on the loops. So the first constraint is that the motion is symmetric in the sense that we can associate each particle to a rotation. And we say that mm, the particle Labeled, labeled with the rotation R is recovered from the 
particle labeled with the identity, simply rotating this trajectory with the corresponding rotation. And this, uh, this particle UI is called generating particle. Then we impose a, a topological constraint in the sense that this uh, symmetric constraint as a consequence because uh, with this symmetric constraint, we have that partial collisions can happen only on the rotation axis of these rotations. So we are forbidden to pass through this rotation axis. Uh, and this axis all passes, pass through the origin of the, of the space. So we have R3 minus uh, a set of lines, which we call uh, gamma. And we want to search for minimizers in a fixed free class of this space, of the space minus the union of all these lines. And now we will see how to find these free homotopy classes. And third condition, we want also that the trajectory of the generating particle itself uh, is symmetric with respect to uh, a fixed rotation. So in these conditions, the action of the body problem is written in this way. So we have kinetic energy plus a potential. And we also note that the dynamics depends only on the generating particle. So it is it there is a three-dimensional dynamics. So now we see how to find this uh, free homotopy class. So we, we, we said that uh, we have the space minus all these uh, lines that we saw here in this figure on the, on the right. Uh, so it turns out that um, we can associate to the group of the platonic polyhedra, another uh, polyhedron, which is an Archimedean polyhedron, which has this property that the rotation axis passes through the center of opposite faces. Uh, so a free homotopy class of R3 minus all these lines is simply identified by a sequence traveling on the edges of this uh, of this Archimedean polyhedron. So now we see how to uh, find, how to compute a periodic orbit. So first of all, we fix uh, an homotopy class. So we fix a path on this polyhedron. And it is simply, if we number the vertexes, uh, we can simply describe it with the sequence of numbers. So in this example, we are uh, traveling in this way. So, okay, we fix this sequence and we compute the Fourier coefficients of this first guess, uh, parameterized in, I mean, we parameterize each segment uh, linearly. So we compute the Fourier coefficients and we start with the gradient descent uh, from this first guess and we obtain something like this. Uh, we can check also the action. So the action of the above path was uh, 1100. And then the final action, which is this path at the end that we saw, that we see here on the left, is uh, 477. But anyways, we, at some point we stopped with the iteration because we saw that the action didn't improve and also the relative differences in the acceleration didn't improve. Uh, so what we do, we have the shooting method. So we take this loop as a first guess and we apply the shooting method and we find something like this. And we can also check the action and we saw that the action has decreased again. So we're pretty confident that we end up in a, in a minimizer. And then we can also reconstruct the whole orbit. 
And here we can see also some videos, for example, these are a bit... Marco, I cannot yeah. hear you anymore. I don't know the others, but... Uh -huh, okay, because I shared only, uh, only this, this window. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, the videos can be found here. Unfortunately, I didn't put the videos uh, here on the, in the presentation. Now you hear me, Julia. 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 I can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, okay. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. I can. So, okay. Great. Uh, so, anyways, I'm sorry that I didn't put the video here, but okay, you can find the videos here on this link. Uh, so we said now we have an initial condition for this periodic orbit and we can uh, do something else. For example, we can study the stability. So we simply have to compute the monodromy matrix, which is the derivative of the flow at time capital T and compute the eigenvalues. <clears throat> so here we recognize two unitary eigenvalues. One is given by the fact that the orbit is periodic and the other one uh, comes from the fact that we have the energy which is conserved. And then we, saw, we see also that there are two eigenvalues which are not unitary and this means that this orbit is unstable. And actually the stability of all these orbits has been studied in this paper and we can also do something more with because we can also use uh, rigorous numerical methods to rigorously prove the instability of this orbit. So what about the minimality properties? We said that you can uh, solve the Jacobi differential equation, see the determinant, and compute some other eigenvalues. So we can do this. And by plotting the determinant of the solution of the Jacobi differential equation, we see that there are no zeros. And also we can construct these additional metrics, compute the eigenvalues, and we found that they are uh, positive. So this is at least uh, a local minimizer because the second variation is positive. Uh, but okay, before I so I said also that the, there's the continuation method. So let's see an example on how to use it. So let's take the same system, but we add uh, another particle in the center with uh, a mass m0, which is free to, uh, to attain every positive uh, value. So this is our parameter and the action has uh, another term in the potential, which is the attraction of the central particle. So we use this uh, central mass as a parameter and we know that for M0 equal to zero, uh, a periodic orbit exists because that, uh, okay, we can compute it and also because there's the work by and green telling us this. So let's see an example of this. So as before, we, we fix a free homotopy class. Okay, here is different from the previous one. And it's seen here. And we apply the gradient method, the shooting method, and we compute a solution for uh, M0 equal to zero which is this one. And we fit this to the continuation algorithm and we try to increase the value of the central mass. So we increase, we compute something for M0 equal to 100. We increase again and M0 equal to 400 here. And we see like a, a behavior in the sense that if we go up again, uh, we see that this red trajectory is going up uh, towards uh, a close encounter because here, this point here correspond to a rotation axis. 
And at the same time, uh, these trajectories here are going to overlap. So this is a clue of what is happening. And actually we can prove something indeed from the calculus of variation point of view. We can prove something using the gamma convergence theorem. And it, we have done this in this preprint here on the bottom. So basically what happens is that, okay, we can rescale the, the action uh, using this, uh, this parameter. Uh, and the action is written in this way. So this is uh, kinetic energy plus attraction of the central body. So this is basically a Kepler problem plus a perturbation, which is small if the central mass is uh, big. And anyways, this perturbation is seen. Uh, so gamma convergence theory is uh, a special kind of convergence for functions. And actually we proved that uh, these functionals, gamma converges to the action of the Kepler problem. But there is a Kepler problem which is defined on a set of loop with this strange topological constraint. And also gamma convergence tells us that sequences of minimizers converges to a minimizer of the Kepler problem of the, uh, of the Kepler problem defined with this topological constraint. And we can actually describe how uh, the minimizers of the Kepler problem are done because they are composed by uh, circular Keplerian arcs joined at some rotation axis. And if we see again what's, what's happening for uh, M0 very large, we see that we, rec we recognize here uh, a rotation axis, this uh, vertex here. And these two, these pieces of uh, the solution are overlapping and they're overlapping towards uh, uh, a circular solution a circular piece of a solution of the Kepler problem. So numerical methods are actually also really useful uh, to uh, guess some properties that can be actually proved with, uh, with theory. Uh, so now uh, I want to speak also uh, to the of the application to another problem, which is the Coulomb one plus n body problem. So now instead of masses, we take charges. Uh, so uh, in the space, we have at, uh, electrons which have negative charge and the charge is equal to minus one. And in the center, we have a nucleus, which is uh, which has uh, a positive charge, and we call it capital Q. So now the Lagrangian uh, is done in this way, and there's a minus sign, and actually the system reminds the Rutherford uh, atomic model. But uh, anyways, we know that this model of the atom is not valid anymore because uh, we know that at this uh, very small uh, scale, there is quantum mechanics playing a role, but anyways, we can try to uh, uh, compute periodic orbits in this context. So we apply uh, the numerical methods. We still impose the symmetry of the platonic polyhedra. And we modify a bit the scheme. Uh, so, well, okay, still we generate a first guess, but in uh, our desired free homotopy class in the same way. But here the gradient method uh, doesn't work in the sense that it didn't converge. So there's something strange going on. And we had to use another method to generate this first guess. Uh, then at second step, we compute a periodic solution for a very large value of the central charge. 
And here we use the shooting method with the previous first guess that we generated. Uh, and then as last step, use the continuation, uh, taking as a parameter the central charge and trying to reduce the value of the, of the central charge because uh, we want to, uh, let's say, to try to balance the system uh, in the sense that um, we want the, the charge of the central mass is equal to the uh, uh, modulus to the charge to the charge of the of the electrons. Uh, so here we experience the common behavior of all of these orbits, in the sense that we reached always a turning point in the continuation with respect to the central charge. So this means that uh, initially the value of the central charge decreases, then we reach a minimum, and it uh, grows again after the minimum. And this means that for each value of uh, capital Q larger than the minima, there are actually two different periodic orbits in the same free model class, but with a different shape. And also the, these orbits are almost stable. So if we see an example, uh, this, here the amount of class is the same that we saw before for uh, the continuation for the M-body problem. So here on the left, we can see the, the orbit uh, for central charge equal to 24. And actually here there are also 24 electrons. So the system here is neutral. And okay, so here the turning point was uh, smaller than 24. So we followed the curve of solution. We arrived to the turning point and uh, grow uh, up again the value of the central charge. And we found another periodic orbit, which is this on the right, uh, where still the central charge is 24. We are in the same free homotopy class, but the shape of this solution is, uh, is different. So there are actually two solutions. And so here, what about the minimality? So here we can do the same. So we compute uh, the solution of the Jacobi differential equation and we compute the determinant. And in general, we see that there are zeros of this uh, determinant. So uh, these solutions are not uh, local minimizers, but it can happen that for some values of the central charge, the determinant is positive, as in this example on the right, where for the purple and the green curve, we don't have any zero. So in this case, we have to uh, compute also these additional metrics, compute the eigenvalues, and see what happens. And here we saw that there are always negative eigenvalues. So the second variation is not positive definite, which means that these orbits are all settled points. And from the variational point of view, OK, these orbits are uh, computed uh, completely numerical, and we don't have uh, a pr a, an actual proof of the existence of these orbits. So this is a clue that uh, to prove the existence of this orbit, we cannot use the same technique used to uh, prove the existence of periodic orbits for the M-body problem, because it relies on the existence of minimizers of the action, but here we see, we experience with numerical methods that uh, these are not minimizers of the action. So my talk basically ends here, and I hope that I convinced you that numerical methods are uh, useful also to uh, prove some rigorous results,
um, before and I would like to take just 10 seconds of advertisement because now I'm involved in this project which, which is called Stardust Reloaded which is a research network for space debris and asteroids and actually there are also some other people here involved in this project and I invite you to visit this website to learn, learn more about this project. So my talk now, it's really at the end and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for this nice presentation. So there is time for questions, comments. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, hello, everyone. Hello, Marco. I'm Ivana from Serbia. I have a two, Hi, uh, two simple questions. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is uh, what is the biological technique to study the stability of symmetric periodic orbits, in your opinion? Which is, sorry? I didn't hear uh, you quite well. What is the best? Okay, okay, I will repeat it, that question. What is the best numerical technique to study the stability of symmetric periodic orbits, in your opinion? Well, uh, You mentioned continuation method and so on. What is the well, best method? Well, in actually, no, here in this context, we are actually able to, I mean, we can compute uh, an initial conditions for these orbits with all these methods. Then you okay. simply have to integrate the, um, the equation of motion yes. with the variational equation, and you obtain the derivatives of the solution with respect to the initial condition. Okay. And then simply you compute the eigenvalues of the matrix that you obtain. So in okay. this context, uh, is uh, is quite reliable to use this method. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And the second one is, uh, where do you see the application of these results? Um, I mean, I I um, I want to say, can you see the application of these results in maybe in double asteroids or multiple asteroids with equal well, masses? Honestly, it's uh, kind of hard to apply these results also because we, we saw that these orbits are all unstable. So it's kind of, of hard to find an application, yeah. Okay, but you can try that <laughs> maybe to find some. Example. Yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice. Yes, it would be nice. Okay, the, this, uh, these were my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Other people want to make questions? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. please. Yes, I'm John Jimeno. I have uh, three small questions, and maybe mm -hmm. some of them are quite easy to, to answer. The first one is the capital T that appears in your notes. Uh, is it known? Oh, yeah, I mean, Probably, whoa, sorry. Maybe I missed that the, slide. But. Yeah, probably I, I've i been a bit too fast. The capital T, do you see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. The capital T is fixed at this point. I mean, it is the period and it is, it is fixed. Okay. So we know how, how it is. And for example, in these examples, it is one. I fix the period to one and for example we can see from here this is the determinant in zero okay. one. I see. Yeah. I see. Then the second question that I have is for the um, linear systems that you need to solve in the Newton step. Did you uh -huh. exploit uh, some iterative solver or you uh, what kind of solver did you use? For this yeah, system. I mean uh, yes, for this system. Did you apply any iterative solver or it's just a standard one? No, just the standard one. I mean, you can use the fact that this matrix, uh, the Jacobian matrix has this structure. Mm -hmm. So you can use this part. 
but I mean, uh, well, actually, since you have two adults, this condition here, which is this transverse, transversality condition, mm -hmm. you have uh, more equation than unknowns. So I use the SVD decomposition to, to okay. solve this system because it's not anymore a squared system. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. And then for uh, this M that you have in this slide, this, this small N, M, um, I guess that it's the number of shootings that you Yeah, have. yeah, it's the number of shooting. And so this is up to you. I mean, you can use whatever you want. <clears throat> yeah, but what kind of values just to have a I mean, of... for example, for this orbit that yes. I showed here, I use like 10 shooting points. But you can use more, you can use less. I mean, it's uh, it's up to you. I mean, of course, if the more shooting point you you use and the more accurate will be the solution near these close encounters. Because you see here that it's almost a, a discontinuity. <laughs> Not a discontinuity, mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, it's almost a vertex. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you use okay. more, probably it's better also, yeah. But okay. I mean, here 10 was enough, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay, other comments or questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Yes, so uh, thank you for a nice talk. My name is Luis from Mexico, and I have a question. Uh, I mean, I cannot appreciate it because I haven't seen your videos, but it doesn't seem mm, like yeah. what you have are choreographies. Rather, it yeah, seems no. like you have a collection of closed curves that are fit together yeah. and some yeah. particles are going around those closed curves. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And can yeah, you so indeed. say Sorry. how many closed curves you have depending on the group that you're choosing? How many? Closed yeah. curves. Do you have the uh, yeah depend on on the group on the group and on the symmetry of this uh, of this red curve for example this uh, red curve that you see here is symmetric by the by rotations that passes through this uh, uh, an axis which is in the center here and this rotation has order three so it's a rotation of basically 120 degrees along this axis. I don't know if you see it. Yeah, yeah, no? yeah. That's clear. If you rotate it, okay. And it depends on the on the order of this rotation. For example, here, here there are uh, there's a dif a different number of these uh, closed curves. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I think there is still time for other questions, if you have. Yeah. Okay, if not, I would like to thank again uh, Marco. So thank you, Marco, thank for you. this nice presentation. And uh, thank, thank you to everyone. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to everyone for attending. The next seminar will be in two weeks. Uh, so see you uh, in two weeks and good, good uh, afternoon to everybody. Thank you.